Kia ora. Words Auckland 2020 is an online series of talks from women sharing their stories about their work and career contributions across many industries and in academia. Words Auckland is an independent event organised by the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering to coincide with the annual Global Women in Data Science Conference. I'm Rosalind Archer, a Woods Ambassador, and I'm delighted to be sharing these inspiring talks. I'd like to thank the Woods Auckland sponsors, Gold sponsors Stats New Zealand, Silver sponsors SAS, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, Finity Consulting, Servian, Todd Digital, and Red Hat. In this talk, we have a chat between a graduate from the University of Auckland at Eleanor Swery, who spent a fascinating career in New Zealand, who's now moved on to become the Director of Sales Technology for Nexar in Israel. So she'll start out with a presentation and then Eleanor and I will have a bit of a chat. Enjoy. Um, so over the last few years, I've really wanted to push myself and, and what you can see on the screen has been kind of my motto around all the decisions I make. Um, it's, it's really important for me to not stay in my comfort zone. I've had a number of times uh, during my life or career um, decisions that I had to make and I've always gone back to this. So really identifying that, that the magic happens outside of the comfort zone. Um, I found myself, you know, after a few years in a certain position that I was really comfortable, that I knew what I had to do, um, that life was easy. But in those moments, you stop learning or your learning slows down. You're not challenged. You're not expanding yourself. You're not extending. Um, and I think it is important to identify those and really challenge yourself and move outside of that comfort zone to really enable magic happen. Um, and you'll see how I go back to this type of thinking um, during the last uh, 12 or so years, um, how I've, I've changed things up and I've moved from one thing to another. And it's mainly been based on that philosophy. So how can I uh, really challenge myself to really extend and learn as much as possible? So I started um, at the University of Auckland in 2008. I signed up for an engineering degree. Um, very cliche, I loved maths and physics at high school. And so it seemed like a natural fit. Um, but at the time I didn't have a, the slightest clue what I wanted to specialize in. I, um, I knew again that I liked maths and physics um, and designing things, but I didn't know what I would specialize in. And so the first year of engineering was really quite a crucial year for me because we got a taster of all the different specializations. Um, I remember one of the specializations in the second semester, so uh, the introduction to computer science, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it was MATLAB and C. Um, and this was the first time I was ever exposed to any sort of coding. And I know that this wasn't standard because a lot of my peers uh, found, you know, they were like, they've been doing this for years and years. I had never written a line of code before that course. Um, and, and that is quite a memorable course for me because as much as it was challenging, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I've used those skills throughout my career, even though I didn't decide to specialize um, in, that, in that department. So I did, at the end of my first year, decide to specialize um, in mechanical engineering because I simply enjoy those courses the most. That was, that was how I based my decision. Um, and I loved it. I, 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 you know, all the courses that I did, I really enjoyed. I enjoyed uh, my, my classmates and the activities and the excursions. Um, here you can see a picture of me with uh, one of my classmates at Marsden Point. We went to look at the ore refinery um, close up. Um, towards the end of the degree, so actually my, my final year project and my fourth year, my honours project, um, I did a project in composite materials. Um, and that did open my, my eyes to um, the potential of doing research and, and continuing my uh, my research career within the university. And so towards the end of my degree, I decided to continue with that because I really enjoyed my, my honors project. Um, and I, I took that project and expanded it um, into a PhD. Um, so again, that was, that was a crucial decision because it wasn't, it wasn't so straightforward. Do I go and take one of the job offers that I've been offered or do I go into the, uh, the kind of research route? Um, and, and one of the things, again, that helped me make the decision was where am I going to be challenged the most? 
So I could take a job anytime. I could go into industry anytime. The specific PhD that was offered to me um, was quite unique in that um, it was in a world-class research center. So the Center of Advanced Composite Materials in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Um, it had a fantastic uh, supervisor. It had great funding. Uh, and most importantly, it had great links to industry. Um, so I decided to take it um, and, and kind of put on pause my, uh, my career in, in the industry. Um, but in saying that, uh, during my degree, I did get a lot of experience in various companies. So I worked as a student at Fisher & Paykel Healthcare for a couple of years, um, and also at SKM, which is now called Jacobs. Um, and I also, I've, I've got the logo of the University of Auckland because I also did a lot of tutoring, which um, I continued on during my PhD. So I got a lot of experience in, in what we call the real world, um, but I did decide to continue in academia um, onto a PhD. So my PhD was looking at um, the manufacturing processes of composite materials, specifically for the automotive industry. So it was, it was pretty exciting because it, was, it had a very specific real world application. Um, during my PhD, I also got to really travel the world. I took part in uh, 12 conferences, um, which I think is unheard of, but I made it a point of mine to really go and, and get to know as many people as possible and work with as many researchers around the world. I, um, I spent six months in uh, Munich, so the Technical University of Munich had uh, a research center that complemented my work. So I was able to really collaborate with top researchers there. Um, and again, my, my main motto during the PhD was to extend myself as much as possible. The research was important, but what was also really important for me was to ensure that people see my research, that the research had visibility, that it wasn't just something that was tucked in a thesis in a library that no one saw. And that is why I did focus on the conferences and around building collaborations with both uh, academic institutes and private institutes. Um, to really make sure that the work uh, is leveraged as much as possible. Now, a PhD in mechanical engineering isn't purely just mechanical engineering. I am um, looking back, I think it had a lot of components from various things um, and it did, you know, uh, use all the skills that I've gained specifically in the first year of my engineering degree. Um, so I would say um, I spent 40% of my time during my PhD writing code, be it uh, writing image analysis codes to analyze images or looking at statistics and how do we analyze that data. It wasn't just what we think of stereotypical mechanical engineering. And I think that's important to note because even though in 2008, I made a, a decision that I'll be a mechanical engineer, we leverage um, skill sets from all over. It's not just what we think of a mechanical engineer, and I think it is important to continuously have an open mind um, and, and not be afraid of, of new things. Um, so I, I finished my PhD within three and a half years um, and, and had that question again of, oh, what do I want to do? And um, this wasn't as straightforward because, you know, you go through school and you know exactly the path and the journey that you, you should take or that you would take. Um, and at the end of the PhD, I really had to do some thinking because I enjoyed my research, but I also realized that what I enjoy the most was making my research accessible to people, was communicating my research, making sure that industry is aware of it, that they leverage those, those uh, insights that we've gained. Um, and, and I realized that in order to do that, and, and I wasn't tied to a specific industry or a specific topic, but I wanted to be at the forefront of communicating um, new advances in, in science and technology. And um, by chance, I went to a networking event where I heard um, a lovely uh, woman talk about her career in digital consulting, and it's exactly what I wanted. It's around taking new technology, communicating it to people, making sure they know how to use it and apply it um, to really maximize the impact. So that was my transition into the IT industry. Um, I got a job at IBM in New Zealand as a digital consultant. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be part of the team that introduced AI um, to, to the New Zealand industry. So IBM has a suite of AI capabilities called Watson. Um, and I joined the team and I, I was part of that, that effort around kind of democratizing that, that, uh, those tools and capabilities 
to various industries within New Zealand and Australia. Um, you, what you can see there is a picture of me and a colleague um, at the World of Watson, which is the, the large international conference around the application of Watson, and that was held in Vegas. So that was pretty exciting. Um, at the same time, what you can see at the bottom is the Tech Futures Lab logo. I, um, I joined uh, Tech Futures Lab as a guest lecturer and an examiner, um, specifically looking at AI capabilities. So people doing their master's courses, I was involved around giving uh, industry expertise, up-to-date knowledge and information, and also uh, grading their research projects. Um, so from IBM, I, uh, one of the projects that I worked on quite closely with was uh, around a project for Soul Machines. So Soul Machines is actually a, a company that was spun out of the University of Auckland um, a few years ago, and they build digital humans. So they build artificial humans that are powered by AI um, that looks super real and you can communicate with them and have a conversation with them. And they did leverage some IBM technology. So that's when I was introduced to that technology. Um, and I made the transition to that company in 2018. So in Soul Machines, uh, my role was a solutions architect. And what that role meant was bridging the gap between our clients, uh, specifically looking at um, both business and technical folks and the company. So I had to um, communicate with both types of people, be it technical uh, folks who needed to implement the technology, who needed to understand how the code works and how to change things up, but also business people who pay for the projects, who have uh, specific needs that they need to use the project for. Um, and that was a fascinating role because I was exposed to so many different companies, so many different stakeholders, and I was representing Soul Machines uh, in front of these international clients and then taking back all those learnings back to Soul Machines to make sure that what we develop um, is, is what the industry needs and wants. Um, so I was, I was in that role for a couple of years, um, got to travel the world, again, work with large international corporates, um, and it was, it was lots of fun. Um, during that time, I was also approached by University of Canterbury to join their, uh, their advisory board for their um, degree of product design, so, which is part of the School of Engineering. Um, so again, got the exposure to help facilitate and help shape the way a degree is taught uh, at a completely different university. Um, and as, as exciting as the role was, and it really was exciting, I was on a plane every three weeks to somewhere different around the world, um, I realized that I was becoming comfortable, that I was not being challenged as much as I was at the beginning. Um, with all of these things, um, when you start something new, it always feels a bit overwhelming. Um, and you're like, what is happening? What am I doing? And then after a while it settles. And then you're kind of in this sweet spot of you're extending, you're learning, you're being challenged, but it's not overwhelming. And, and for me, once that, that starts declining, once I see that I'm really comfortable, that I don't need to put in extra effort, that I don't need to reach out to people to ask questions, that's when I start thinking about the next move because I, I don't think anyone should, should be comfortable, at least I shouldn't be comfortable at a certain place because um, then um, I, I'm not making the most of my, my potential. Um, so towards the end of uh, 20, no, the, the beginning of 2019, um, I decided that it's time to move on to the next challenge. Um, and actually, I, I made quite a big move this time around. So um, I was, for a number of years, I was working quite closely with a number of uh, top leaders in the New Zealand industry. And um, I thought it was important to get some uh, international experience and really work in a different ecosystem to mine without having all the support system that, that I've built over the last few years. Um, so I decided to move to Tel Aviv. Um, Israel is one of the largest ecosystems for, for startups and I, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to see um, what, makes, what makes a successful ecosystem so successful. Why are Israeli um, entrepreneurs so sought after around the world? What can I learn from them? Um, so I joined a company called Nexar and it's a Dashcam based company and I'll talk about it a, a bit later on. Uh, but within Nexar, I've, uh, I've, I was in a role of product management for a year. 
um, and now I'm the director, director of sales technology. So again, being the bridge between technical and business folks and making sure that we deliver high quality products um, and, and communicating and making sure that people understand each other, both from a client perspective um, and, and uh, the company. Um, so I wanted to, to tell you a bit about what we do at Nexa and specifically how data science is embedded into everything we do. And again, I'm a mechanical engineer, but through my PhD, I was exposed to different fields, different skill sets. And with time, I've gained more and more. And, and I think data science, the more I think about it, the more it's generic to so many industries. Uh, you use it everywhere, even without realizing. Um, so Nexa develops dash cams, and I've got, I've got one here. Um, and these dash cams uh, connect to your phone through an app. And for the drivers, they record everything that goes on um, on the road. So if you're in an incident um, and someone blames you for it, you've got visual evidence of what actually happened. Uh, we also run algorithms behind the scenes to detect what were important events and what weren't. So if you had a harsh break, we can detect that from the sensor data um, and we flag it and we can send it to your insurance provider and do all sorts of smart stuff. Um, but what I wanted to, to kind of show you and, and highlight was how much uh, we rely on data for every decision we make. So I was a product manager for a year and I was in charge of every decision that was made around the app um, and how the camera was integrated into it. Now, as a product manager, your job is to listen to various stakeholders, be it current users, be it people from uh, within the organization, sellers, engineers, you listen to support and you get a huge amount of information and you have to make decisions around what features we develop next, what changes we make, how do we prioritize things. And every decision that you make has to be backed up by data. It's not enough to say, oh, this button is too big, it's taking up too much space on the screen. You need to do A-B tests. You need to run a test with a smaller button to see whether people actually hit the button on the first time round. Can we capture how many times they've tapped different areas and they miss the button before they reach that button? If it's not much, then maybe we can decrease the size of the button. Um, what about making a decision around whether a certain color stands out more than another? We can have hypotheses, but we will never push out a change without the data to support it. And that's really important because designing products isn't just based on your gut instinct, it's based on uh, data-driven decisions and prioritizing things and getting things pushed out the door relies on data. People take you so much more seriously when you've got data to back up your decisions. Um, so what you can see here on the slides are some of our cameras, the app, um, and we've also been working on an augmented driving experience. That's where um, you can get navigation with, um, with assistance about how the road looks like today because you're part of a network of drivers that all see the road in near real time. The other side of the business, so we've got a huge network of drivers that are driving with these dash cams. The other side of the business is how do we uh, leverage all that data to provide insights around the state of the road. We're at a huge advantage because through our network of drivers, we see the roads, uh, near, all the roads in the states nearly every day. And so we can detect things like roadway changes. So is there a pothole? Did the markings on the road change? And then we can use that uh, information to inform our drivers or other businesses. Uh, we can spot um, parking spots uh, using our AI models that run on our app and on our servers. Um, and what you can see at the last picture is, uh, is detections, real-time detections of construction zones. Again, to give different stakeholders that data around, you know, should I drive for a certain place or not? Um, so if I, if I go back to, to my journey, um, I don't think that in 2008, an 18-year-old Eleanor would have known um, what her career could have looked like. You know, she knew that she wanted to be an engineer, um, but I didn't know what specialization and what that entails. Um, and even though I did mechanical engineering, I was exposed to many different fields. And, and again, the, the role of data science, uh, I've, I think I've, I see the importance of it now more than ever um, around making smarter decisions and making sure that uh, we optimize everything as much as possible. All right. Fantastic. Um, maybe 
maybe you and I could just have a quick chat. If you uh, stop sharing those slides, then we can just hang out for a moment. Um, I was really excited to, to hear you kind of with some recollections of that first coding class. I uh, yeah. <laughs> remember you're, you're, I was involved in that, yeah. Yeah. in that class. So I love I love seeing these. People. I think I think you know I I took the class because I saw that the lecturer was going to be in the tutorial, um, and and I think that did you know it, it made a huge impact because as I alluded to, a lot of my classmates said, "Oh, this is easy. I've done this before. I've done it my whole life." And I think being surrounded by other people in the class, you know, other women who've not necessarily been exposed to it, but knowing that it's okay and knowing that we can catch up in no time, I think made a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is really great advice because we still, you know, talk to people wanting to come to engineering school saying, oh, but I've never written a line of code, you know, I, I can't do that. Um, and I assure people still that, you know, as long as you can turn on a computer and start a web browser to figure out what room the lecture's in, <laughs> that's all you need. We can, yeah, uh, yeah. can go from there. It's really true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, wonderful to see, uh, to see living proof of that. And I, I also really loved your, your ethos about, about your comfort zone and, and just making sure you get out of that comfort zone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, maybe, maybe one day, you know, in the future when I retire, I'll be like, okay, no, it's time to slow down. But I think, I think as long as I can, like continuously being challenged is important. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's really healthy. And it, that's clearly, clearly a sort of a, a philosophy that, uh, that works for you. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think some people possibly... Um, you know, are also looking for maybe a slightly, a slightly different uh, lifestyle. I mean, you've clearly uh, racked up a lot of frequent flyer miles. Um, <laughs> as do I. Not so useful anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they're looking kind of yeah. stale in an, in an account somewhere. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think one thing I would want to reiterate, especially to to women wanting careers in this space, is there's plenty of room for all kinds of kind of career models. So from people who are working more flexibly, um, you know, my co-host Kate, uh, we're recording first thing in the morning, my co-host Kate is out dropping her daughter at school. And, um, you know, we're seeing employers, I think, more and more willing to sort of accommodate whatever your definition of work-life balance is, <laughs> whether it's yours, mine, or, or somebody else's. Yeah. It's no. uh, it's interesting. So so now in Israel, uh, the COVID situation is pretty bad. Uh, but what's been working really well is the ability to work from home. So our company, and I know a lot of companies around, um, we've been free to work from home since March. Um, and I think, you know, they, they kept the office open in case you wanted to come, but there was no expectation of anyone to come into the office. And I think, again, this, this is a huge exercise of of working from home has shown people how great it can be and how great it can be to have that flexibility. Um, and I think it increases the motivation for people like, yeah, having yeah, clear I mean, ownership of that. Absolutely. This kind of massive uh, online experiment the world has been in, I think will will do a lot for kind of advancing kind of flexible work. And, um, you know, I look forward to getting on a plane again soon, but you know, I counted up yeah. yesterday in my diary. I talked to people in 12 different countries yesterday from my home. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's not unusual. So, um, yeah, the world has become a really interesting place. Yeah, a different place. Yeah. I, I'm curious, too, if you encounter any kind of... Um, uh, sort of ethical issues around, you know, any of your adventures in data, because you've worked for some companies that are doing some really interesting things. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting one. So I think, um, I think as long as um, I know that the company means to do well, and, and so there are, the applications of what we do is really important for me. So if we look at the work that we did with soul machines around digital humans. So one side of the argument could say that, oh, these digital humans are putting people out of job. Um, but the other side of it means that we're democratizing knowledge. We're making uh, different things accessible to people. 
And I think that as long as I feel comfortable with the fact that we're doing more good than potentially harm, then, then it's a net uh, benefit. I, um, but, but in saying that, there, there have been times where, you know, I've identified projects where it was merely, um, you know, doing it for the sake of doing it or doing, you know, not in a specific company, but, um, and, and I did raise a flag. I did say, you know, it's, a, it's important to think about it. The work that we do at Nexa, for example, um, I, I know that I would give one of these cameras to my parents and I have because I feel comfortable with it. We, we take all possible measures around um, anonymizing the data, making sure that everything is uh, stored securely. Um, and, and the data that we leverage off it after at the end benefits my parents. So they collect data using their, their camera um, and then they can see data from other people in the network. So I think as long as there's um, something in it for people and as long as there's a benefit, then that's okay. But yeah, exploiting people and exploiting data, uh, something that I've tried to stay away from. It, yeah. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I think it's space where everyone's just got to be asking questions kind of continually just to make sure that that things really do make do make sense but uh, no, yeah yeah, yeah sounds yeah. like you're asking those questions yeah cool well i um have really enjoyed the chance to <laughs> catch up and and see where the eleanor that i must have met at what 18 19 yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> quite some time ago yeah <laughs> yes yeah um, tell me i'm interested in and in hearing your perspective have you seen like what was the biggest change you've seen in women in engineering in the last uh, the last ten or so years, yeah. Oh, I'm re like I'm really interested whether like first year engineering students today are the same as what they were in in two thousand and eight. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting question. I think I think in general, you know, across a number of different angles in in our faculty, what I see is our students have a total freedom to be who they are and what they are. I mean, the faculty really, really does genuinely embrace kind of all forms of diversity. It's It's been on quite a journey. Uh, so for instance, at the moment, you know, I'm, I've teamed up with the Rainbow Engineering Group and am, you know, publicly supporting a, um, a fundraising uh, health campaign for the, for the Rainbow community. I'm not sure if that would have happened in 2008. I don't think the group even existed then. So, um, yeah, I think the, the faculty is a place that is, is very much open, open to all. Um, I think we probably still do see some of the underlying threads that, that women sometimes have around confidence, around that willingness to get outside their, their comfort zone. Um, you know, unfortunately, that that's a theme that perhaps hasn't uh, hasn't changed, um, and is is going to take um, you know really social change right back through the schooling system to sort of deal with some of these embedded ideas. I mean, the research shows that women, um, young women, make decisions on kind of who can do science and tech um, as early as age seven. Mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah, so, but we're, we're out there to kind of showcase all sorts of interesting examples of uh, people that you know, become, become visible in the space. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Cool, that's neat. Awesome. All right. Okay, well, I look forward to uh, sharing this chat with everybody on our <laughs> YouTube channel and I'll wish you all the best. Awesome, thank you. All right, okay. it's good catching up. Yep, Bye. see you.